We're joined by Sean Green, former Major League Baseball player, 14 seasons, correct? Yeah, ish. Give or 14 take, 14-ish. 14-ish. Yeah. Uh, now turned athlete entrepreneur. And as you look back at those 14-ish years, right, you, you go on a journey that I'm assuming is probably similar to what it is that you're going on now, but from a very different kind of lens. Yeah, no, it is. I think as an athlete, you go through the, you know, you're starting a career. It's almost like you're trying to start, but you're trying to make something up. Like, do I belong here? Do I know what I'm doing? Um, and you start figuring it out. You, you kind of get more confidence as you, you know, pass the different levels and start, you know, go from A ball, double A, triple A, all of a sudden you're in the big leagues. And do I belong? You, you hopefully perform well enough to belong. You see all your heroes from, you know, along the way that you're or your teammates or you're playing against. And, and then you go through a lot of ups and downs. And I think it's very similar as a startup. You know, you kind of throw something out there in the, into the world, yeah. um, especially in our case, it was sort of creating a new, a new space. And when you start to get traction with customers, you get that confidence. And then you go through the ups and downs, um, just like anything. And, and the more times you pick yourself back up after the, the tougher times, the, um, you know, the more confidence you, you have and the better you are moving forward. Yeah. And then when you, you know, take a step back and we look back at the journey drafted straight out of high school, attended Stanford in the summer, right? Between yeah, when you winter, guys were yeah. doing winter, yeah. uh, between what you were playing. What was, what was that like, you know, getting that first check going straight into minor league baseball? And, you know, you hear all the stories about minor league baseball now. Was it, was it, I'm assuming probably just as bad as it is now? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was actually a lot of fun. I mean, you don't, yeah. you don't make, aside from the guys who are, are fortunate enough to have a, a good bonus yeah. um, with the draft, um, which is what lured me, you know, away from playing at Stanford, which I had assumed I was going to do. Um, you, you don't make much money. Yeah. So you're, you're living, you know, I think the first year, most of the players, even until recently are making like 750 bucks a month. Yeah. So, you know, basically you're, you got four guys crammed into an apartment and, and they're good guys. And, you know, I was forced to get drafted by the Blue Jays who at the time, um, was definitely like the class of, of baseball. They, everything was run really well. Pat Gillick was the general manager um, who ended up winning a couple World Series there. He went on to Philly and won a World Series and he just did things the right way. So um, we had, they, they were, it's really important to them to get good guys. And, you know, you, you, you're you like brothers. You're traveling around together, you go and play winter ball together and you get to know these guys. And, and uh, you know, it's a lot of fun, but it's definitely not something you want to do more than a few years and and when you're older than you know 19 20 21 years old once you get to your mid 20s it's it's not really the place you want to be was there a time when you were there probably you know a year two years in when you're like man i could have gone to stanford and went to a <laughs> division one school got my you know and got drafted later on did you ever have those thoughts as you came up through the ranks no because I, I wanted to be a baseball player yeah. and and you know it's like if you want to be a doctor you go to med school if you want to be a baseball player and you have the opportunity and you get drafted high enough where you know one not only they're giving you money to pay for an education which i i used um, to go to stanford in the off season for a couple years um but they're invested in you to succeed and and it's different than college in that college they want to win right in the minor leagues you know you could be a game out of first place or a game up in first place and you're ready to go to the next level they're going to send you up to the next level yeah. if, if that's what they believe is best for the organization so they're worried about the major leagues winning. So they're trying to develop players. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't trade the experience I had, you know, for anything. Came up with great, great guys. I ended up playing long. I played with ten years with Carl Stogato, yeah. you know, who's, you know, should be, uh, should have got more consideration for the Hall of Fame um, than he did. Uh, so you know, a lot of, a lot of great friends that I made there, and and uh, I think I became a better player than I would have had I had I gone to college and, and played there for a few years. Did you have this moment at? when you were playing when you're like all right I, I know this is gonna happen right did you ever have those like conversations or the manager came in and told you like look like you're you're on your way yeah i mean baseball is what i, I always plan on on being a baseball player and, and so from the time i was a kid you know it wasn't like i want to be a baseball player. It was like this is what i'm gonna do yeah. um and you know in the minor leagues i i started off my first year at a high a level which was really hard you know it's a, it a tough place so you know my first year you know i did okay but for you know for a 19 year old, I did really well. So I think I, I hit about 270 something with just one home run. I was yeah. more of a leadoff guy in high school. And the next year I went to double A, it was just enough to get me to double A. And uh, it did a little bit better, you know, hitting the 280s with four home runs, but I still wasn't, I got called up in September, which was kind of part of my contract. Um, the team went on to win the world series. So I got a ring, which nice. is kind of nice, yeah. but um, you know, I didn't play in the postseason or anything. My 0 for 6 after the team clinch didn't really help much, but um, anyway, 
And then the next year I went to AAA and that's kind of when everything sort of clicked. I was yeah. at the time I was, um, I guess I was 21 and, uh, you know, I, I just got off this incredible start for, for me. I think I had a multi, multi-hit game the first like week of the season. So I, I just got off this great start and that just built my confidence. And I had a manager who um, now is hitting third in the lineup as opposed to like, you know, six or so, which I was before. And he, I think having a manager that really believed in me um, made a huge difference. And then the hitting coach was Bill Buckner, who's, yeah. you know, legendary for, you know, the wrong reason. He passed away in the last year, but he was a great guy. Uh, he was also a great hitter that yeah. people forget about. But, um, yeah, I remember the day I got called up, I just broke a, a hitting streak, I mean, you know, about 15 games or so. And I was doing really well. I was leading the league in hitting, and things were going great. And I wasn't thinking much about going to the big leagues. And all of a sudden, before the game, he just said, hey, you ready? And I thought he was talking about the game. Yeah. I said, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. Game, yeah, that's mean? why I'm here. And then, you know, we take batting practice and I come off the field and my name scratched off the lineup card because I was supposed to, you know, be batting third and yeah. playing left field at the time. And which was a little weird. They moved me from right field to left field because I knew that. So that was making me a little suspicious because yeah. there was this opening in the big league level in left field. Got it. Um, there was going to be. And and then I got called the manager's office. And, and once he called me and I knew I was like, I got my heart started pumping. You know, first person I called, you know, were my my parents, first people. And uh, so, yeah, that was a great moment. It was something that, you know, every player dreams of. And, and then when I, I went up, I struggled. Yeah. I was up for a month and um, got sent back down. Um, and I was actually happy to go back down because I got up to the big leagues and I wasn't playing every day. I was struggling and all my friends were down there. And, uh, you know, all the guys on the team were, you know, a lot of guys in their 30s and married. I'm 21 years old and just kind of lonely. And, and so I went back down, everyone was making fun of me because I was the one guy who was happier, I think, coming back yeah. down to the minor leagues than I was going back, going up to the big leagues. And from a, I wouldn't say a culture shock, but I'm sure it's a change to go up and then come back down almost like it's like getting in an ice bath and then getting out of an ice bath, right? It is, yeah, it's weird. And, and a lot of guys, you know, I, I did it that one time, yeah. up and down, where a lot of guys, they'll spend, you know, two or three seasons bouncing back and forth, you know, a, a relief pitcher or backup catcher or something like that. A lot of those guys will just bounce. And, you know, that's, that's tricky because, you know, they, they, they kind of have one foot in each door and they're trying to, um, find that spot where they, you know, kind of lock in permanently. And it, it, it's a little tough when you don't have, um, when, when you're just, you're kind of, you know, floating around like a, like a leaf in the wind. Yeah. And I'm sure that played a role in what you've become now, right? You look at living 750 bucks a month, you're with four guys in an apartment, going back and forth, you're not sure what you can do. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you probably had those feelings along the way, whether it's the entrepreneurial endeavors with your family, as they're growing and you're moving, like, I'm sure it prepared you a lot for what it is that you are now. It did. And, and, you know, back then it was, when you're in the minor leagues and even when you're first coming up, you're really focused, you're on the, in the moment, yeah. right? Which is a big thing for me. I try to, I try to do that. And, um, you always kind of remind yourself to go back to it, but, um, yeah, I mean, you, you're just trying to do well each day and you know, you have this goal that's, you know, in the distant future, it's kind of like, you know, entrepreneur, you have this yeah. goal that someday I want to have this great exit with, with our company, whatever that exit may be. Um, uh, but you, you can't really spend too much time thinking about that. You got to focus on, um, you know, executing and, and what, where the company is, what, what it needs to do to succeed. And it's the same exact thing, you know, in, in baseball and, and, you know, even moving on, as you said, with family, you have young kids or whatever, it's, it's, you know, the more you could be wrapped up in, you know, what you're trying to accomplish at the, that moment, I think the better off the, the future is going to be. And, and how large of a role do you think that played in just the rest of your life, right? In terms of if you're looking at this, this time, 2021, 20, 22, uh, bouncing back and forth, like how do you like when you look back on it now, right? Have the contract, you've succeeded, you've played plenty of years. Did you imagine then what you did in the bigs? No, I didn't. So I was one of those guys that I, I sort of uh, figured things out. I, I got to a level where my first few years I was, a you know a good major league player yeah. you know i'd hit in the 280s hit you know 15 ish home runs and i was playing against righties only and you know it could have been a really nice career and yeah. and all that but then you know i had this this period where you know my manager didn't want to play me anymore the gm wanted me to play and they wanted to change my swing wanted me to try to hit, pull the ball and hit more home runs and and so i was benched for like a month yeah. and while i was benched i sort of you know went through this you know kind of life change where i was like okay i'm just gonna you know, really kind of turn this, 
my daily routine into meditation and, and just focus on and work on my swing. And I, and I did that. And all of a sudden I got a chance to play every day. The, the GM said, Hey, want, you got to play this guy if we're going to trade him and to get the value up. Yeah. Cause no one wants to trade someone sitting <laughs> on the bench. So I start playing and the first day back, I hit two home runs. And then I just went on this like tear. And I think it was all because of that month of, you know, a big step back, I sort of recalibrate everything. I kind of figured out um, some stuff with my swing and, and that was, you know, this defining moment in, in my career. And, you know, I think I would have never reached um, the levels that I did as a player had I not gone through that. I would probably just kind of stayed um, on the course that I was already on, which was, which was good. And when you're on a, a course and same thing in business, when you're yeah. on a course that's working um, enough, then you really don't, you're, you don't make changes. You're kind of scared to make changes. Cause like, okay, I don't want to do anything that, that's going to disrupt this um, progression. Um, but then when something happens, you hear about startups all the time where they, you know, had some like Slack is a good example where, yeah. you know, they're building uh, a video game company and they had this completely pivoted, completely pivoted because, you know, that wasn't quite working. And I was like, wait a second, what is working? And you figure that out Chat and you, functionality and you, yeah. and you go with it. And then, you know, taking that step back, was there a time when you took that step back when you're like, you maybe even began to question, like, is this for me? Is this like what I want to do? Is, is this long term if I reached my ceiling? Yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of baseball players, baseball hitting is especially hitters. It's, it's so hard and there's so many ups and downs and you go you show up one day and you feel like I can, I can't hit at all. And then you have times where you feel like, um, I got this figured out. You learn over time that neither one of those are true. Yeah. Um, which is what experience is, but yeah, I mean, there's plenty of times where, you know, I'm thinking to myself, why am I putting myself through this? This is torture. Yeah. And, and I know, cause I've, you know, played with all these guys, guys who are in the hall of fame, guys who had incredible careers and every one of them felt the same way at, at different times. Yeah. And, you know, all those things are, are great life lessons. Cause you think that, you know, you watch TMZ and you see all these superstar, you know, celebrities yeah. that are having just as many life problems, if not more than the average person. So you, you kind of realize that no one's immune to, you know, what the challenges of life. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's, it's refreshing to see some of my heroes, you know, even like when I first got called up, Ricky Henderson was my hero and he was yeah. struggling. He kept, he was on the blue Jays and I went to early batting practice. He's hitting in every group. And like, he's talking to me, who's 20 years old at the time. Like, you know, what do you think's I'm doing with my swing? I'm like, geez, I, you know, I, I used to keep, I used to keep, you know, the tickets after the game yeah. when you stole a base and wrote the, the number of the stolen base when yeah. I was eight years old, you know, and you're asking me. Um, so I mean, you kind of have those experiences and you realize that, um, you know, we're all the same. Yeah. And, the, and that early stage too, looking back, who was, was it like a Ricky or who were these other guys that kind of took you under the wing, the manager? I know you mentioned that probably played a role in, in the future progression, even, you know, now. Yeah, no, there's so many, so many guys. I mean, uh, in Toronto, I, I mentioned Carl Stogato, you know, we played, he was always kind of like a like a slightly older brother than, you know, and, and, uh, helped me a lot in a lot of ways. Um, Tony Fernandez was a great teammate who I learned a lot about watching him and talking to him about hitting, um, you know, a guy who got, got a really bad rap at Jose Canseco when he got traded over to, uh, the blue Jays, he played one year with us and had a great year. Yeah. And, you know, at the time, this is right after, you know, those first three years where I was kind of in this, you know, pretty good player trajectory. Um, he told me in spring training, he's like, if you don't hit 30 home runs and steal 30 bases this year, then, then I'm never talking to you. And I'm like, really? Like I've never hit more than 16 yeah. and stolen more than probably, you know, a dozen bases. Yeah. And sure enough that year I was able to do that. But I think having someone that was, you know, such a big star that saw the potential in me, um, was, you know, a, a big confidence boost. Yeah. And so, you know, you tear it up the last few months, few years there and get traded to the Dodgers here in LA, come back closer to home, become one of, you know, the highest paid players on the Dodgers at the time. What was that pressure like coming back home to your probably hometown team that you cheered for and, and now having a few years under your belt, but like saying, how do I get to that next level? Yeah. So it was a weird time. Cause I, when I got traded, I was I was very confident. Yeah. At this point I, I figured it out because I hadn't, from the time I made this leap, I hadn't had a setback really. Right. Um, so I get traded and I think, um, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna kill it. Yeah. And I get off to a pretty good start, but in my mind, it wasn't as good. Cause I was really focused on the home runs at this point. Cause I, like I said, I went from hitting no more than 16 home runs to all of a sudden I hit 35 and then 42 and I signed this big deal. So now the bar is really on the home runs. Yeah. 
and the batting average goes up and down. So it's like, okay, if you get off to a slow start, you have a good week, your batting average goes up 20 points. So you don't really worry as much about that, but I was really fixated on home runs. Yeah. And after, you know, a couple months in LA, I, I was on pace to hit maybe 30 home runs where the year before I hit 40 something, you know, over 40, I'm like, okay, I got to start hitting more home runs. Yeah. And I kind of became obsessed with it. Yeah. And, and I just tanked in all ways. I, I went, I, I struggled. I ended up, you know, hitting my lowest batting average, like 260 something and only hit 24 home runs. And so like, it was just a really hard season. And, you know, looking back, the numbers weren't horrible, but based on, you know, the expectations they were. And, and I will say like, from then on, I bounced back the next couple of years, the next two years, but I think, um, I didn't enjoy playing in the same way that I did. It, it, I kind of lost that sense of, um, being in the moment because now all of a sudden I had this contract that was a six year contract that set the bar really high. Yeah. And, you know, I was, I felt like I had to constantly prove myself, especially when you get traded to a new team and you see it all the time in baseball and in sports where a guy goes to signs a big contract, goes to a new team and struggles the first year and sometimes longer. Um, I think you're, if you sign with a team that you sort of earn that contract with, then they already, the fans, you, they already know you, but now you go to a new, new league, a new, um, a new team and, and you want to show them why, you know, they signed you for that, that kind of money. Yeah. And with you and what was going on around you and all of baseball, right? We're tail end and, you know, thick of the steroid era for the most part, you're seeing these ballooning numbers. I'm assuming like, what, what was the pressure like in like the, inside the locker room, whether it's not, you saw people take steroids or, you know, you knew people who did, right? Like, what was that like for you in terms of like, was it the tempt? Was it like you wanted to be like, you know, hitting 50 home runs? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was kind of the opposite for me. Yeah. Like I, I was, I was really cocky in that once I figured out my swing, I was like, okay, I can hit the ball further than these guys. And I was always, my nickname was Flacco, which is skinny. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I used to like to impress my teammates or other players, like by hitting the ball further and being skinny. So I, I, you know, I still worked out and did my stuff, but I was never, I was never tempted to take steroids. And I think for me, it was much more of a health concern than anything yeah. else. I mean, I, I never, um, I never looked down on people who did. I know a lot of guys did at the time. You could tell it was kind of something we joked about with like, oh my God, look at someone got a magic weight bench uh, yeah. over the holidays, you know, cause February rolls around, they show up to spring training and they're like, Pfft. but uh, you know, it was not something that I, I was willing, like I never, I never chewed tobacco or yeah. I never, you know, took the stimulants. I, I just never wanted to do that stuff to my body. And I was always, you know, kind of paranoid about that. Um, so that was the the biggest reason. And, and it's sort of, yeah, like I said, it drove me in the other direction. Once I figured out how to hit home runs, it's like, okay, I could do this, you know, as good or better than most of these guys um, without it. And so that I kind of, that fueled a different, a different angle. What was the conversation around like in the locker room too? You see, you probably had other guys who were like, well, should I do this? You know, this guy's getting paid more. Do I not do this? Cause I'm, you know, health, health issues, right? Like I'm sure it was a daily battle between people, especially like, you know, those guys bouncing back and forth and then these guys signing hundreds of millions of dollar deals. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't really like, if you weren't taking steroids, then I think people didn't just come up to you and say, you know, should I, do you think I should do this? Like, I'm sure they would go up to the guys who were and say, Hey, you know, what should I do to look like you? And, and will I add, you know, if, if I'm a pitcher, would it add a few miles an hour to my fastball? Like what, what, tell me what to do. And I think it was more that, but you know, the guys who didn't, which was, you know, a lot of us, um, you know, it was kind of, it's kind of funny. Like you, you sort of like joke around about it. It's like, Oh my God, look at so-and-so, you know? And, yeah. and we kind of laugh and, um, and, and that was about it, but it wasn't, it wasn't like a, a hot topic of conversation. Uh, I think you just, um, you just kind of use your eyes and, and you, you'd see things. And there's, there's a lot of people that came out in the Mitchell reporter and other, uh, in other, uh, you know, some of the other scandals that I would have never guessed. So, um, with, I mean, the thing that is a bummer about it is like everyone who played in that era, especially if you had home runs or, you know, or a pitcher that threw really hard, like it, people all suspect, they suspect all of us. And that, that kind of sucks. Cause I, you know, like, like I said, I was more focused on being, you know, the, the anti steroid person. Yeah. So coming to LA, signing the big deal, what was that like, you know, moving back to the city of the lights, right? Hollywood, having a big contract, you know, was their pressure from you from just like, you know, now as you look at it as an entrepreneur, but their pressure from you to like 
spend and keep up with the Joneses, right? And I'm assuming not just based off of the background, but what was that like too, walking into that? Yeah, I mean, LA, it was, it was great. I wanted to go to a big market and I sort of, uh, I was in position to kind of force either a long-term deal in Toronto or a trade because I was going to be a free agent. Yeah. And uh, so I, I went with uh, the latter, but I, uh, it was weird coming home um, because I lived here in the off season and um, it was, it felt like a different world to me. So it's like all of a sudden I'm playing and my mindset was hard to put that in because Toronto was my, was my baseball world and LA or, you know, California was my, was my off season. So now I'm merging those two and it'd be weird because I'd be at my house that I lived in the off season and it's like, okay, I got to go to the game. And it just felt like I wasn't supposed to, like I was supposed to relax. And so it was kind of, it was, it was hard. And then you have the, a lot of ticket requests. And so that side of things, it was hard, I think, for anyone who goes to play at home for the first time because you you merge those worlds, right? Um, in terms of Hollywood and all that, I you know, it was fun. It was fun, you know, seeing, meeting celebrities that came to the game that were big Dodger fans. And, you know, that was that was all cool. There was no, there was no like added pressure or things like that. Um, you know, once you're on the field, you're, you're, you know, playing the game and it was a beautiful place to play and it was nice to play you know, in amazing weather, you know, we had, I think one rain out, which was a surprise to even have one in the five years I was a Dodger, um, at home at least. And you, know, you have fans that, you know, I think almost 4 million fans a year would show up at Dodger stadium. So it was, it was, there was no better place to play. Yeah. <clears throat> and as you look back to and now, obviously we have these conversations about athletes going broke and were the locker room already shifting at that time to more of like, Hey, we should be investing. Or was it saying, Hey, look at this house I just got. Right. Especially for someone who signed a, a big deal. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's both. It, it's not, um, yeah, I, I, I think people are, are smarter now. They keep getting smarter on how to handle their money. Um, you know, there was, there's always different, eras like when I played um you know a lot of us built houses big houses because the real estate kept going up and then everything tanks and so you know guys got hurt in real estate which um usually isn't the case I think a lot of people lose more money and with cars and planes and travel and things like that but um or bad investments but um yeah I mean I, I think people look out for each other in that regard and, and want um if they have good experience or bad experience, they, they sometimes, you know, often want to share that stuff with teammates or younger players to, to help them. Cause you know, everyone wants, you know, people who've gotten to that level, you know, if, if you've experienced that to say, Hey, you know what, I want, I want you to be able to enjoy this for the rest of your life and, and try to, you know, avoid some of the pitfalls. What were some of the like wackiest requests you got early on? I'm assuming you probably had people coming to you invest in this, hey, family and friends going, hey, you know, I got this new company, you know, what, what was that like too? I'm sure there was another element of, of that as you, as you matured into the you know, second half of your career. Yeah, I mean, there's both sides. There's, there's a lot of, you know, friends and family wanting money for things, like, you know, different, oh, I got a great idea for this, you know, the startup and the flip side, uh, you know, I played with guys and, you know, I passed on some things here and there, like a friend of mine played, a teammate of mine played in Seattle when Starbucks started in, said, I'm not going to invest in that. No one, so, they, so he got approached. He's like, no one's going to pay three bucks for a cup of coffee. Right. So in other pains. Now, <laughs> that's right? right. Yeah. So you have both sides of it and it's, you know, it's really, I think it depends on what kind of contract you, you sign because, um, you know, I, people who, especially nowadays, the money's gotten so big that, you know, I think if you try to stay middle of the fairway and, uh, you, you'll, you'll be fine. Right. I mean, I'm not the best example because here I got a startup and yeah. did it and all, did all those types of things. But um, yeah, I mean, if you do do a startup, I I think the key is is to make sure you have the right people involved with you, and that's you know comes down to everything. Just like in, in the game, you want good teammates, and uh, and that's the key. And that's kind of what's happened for me as I've I've, I've been fortunate to have you know my co-founder Daniel Kirshner and the team we built um, have been the right people. And what, what was it like with playing with some of these guys, right? You know, you mentioned Ricky Henderson playing with him, Carlos Delgado. I'm sure they probably went through a lot of this stuff too. Nuggets or information that they passed on to you as you were coming up that you, you know, maybe even take with you today. Yeah, I mean, it, Ricky is a guy who 
he actually saved, you get like a little envelope of meal money and he saved like every single envelope wow. that he had and he'd give them to his kids like at different times. Like he'd just give him an envelope of like this 10 day road trips, meal money. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, there's a lot of different approaches and, um, you know, my approach was to trust. I had a good agent, Jeff Morad, and, um, he, steered me to some good financial advisors in, in Texas that I, that I am still with today. And, and, and just to trust those people. And that was always the advice. Like if you find someone good, um, you know, just trust them, listen to them. And they've been through this before, you know, the firm that I'm with RGT, they have, you know, however many dozens of athletes, a lot of football players and baseball players and, and, you know, as well as business, you know, business people. But, um, it's, you know, you have this team around you and you want to rely on people that know a lot more than you do. What was the favorite purchase you made? Maybe a little like crazy or not crazy, like early on, you know, coming off the, the big deal. Early on. So yeah, when I first signed, I had a teammate um, who bought a Dodge Stealth, which would look, look like this fancy car. Yeah. And so, you know, I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, and so I, so I bought one and, uh, you know, I had it for a couple of years. And I was like, you know, it's kind of, <laughs> this isn't as cool as I <laughs> yeah, thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I was, see, that's the thing is I'm not like a big car guy. I didn't go out and buy, you know, a Porsche or things yeah. like that. But, um, I was always more of a tech, I love tech. So, you know, I, I'd always get the nicest, you know, flip phone or whatever they had back then. And, and those are, t are laptops. Um, I always was an Apple guy and then briefly switched over. My teammates were all making fun of me because they said, oh, you know, why can't you use, why can't you use that software, play that game on your computer? I was like, you know, it's a Mac, but they don't, they don't have it. Like, yeah. And so I'm like, okay, I need to switch. So I switched for a few years and then, you know, came back in the early two thousands, but yeah, I was more, I was more into tech than I, than I ever was into, uh, you know, nice cars or things like that. Yeah. And so as you head in, you know, we're talking about Los Angeles times, you head into the time with the Diamondbacks and then the Mets, as you approach the latter half of your career, how did you start thinking about, I wouldn't say like phasing out but the next step right and getting into this point right obviously you didn't start green fly and, and what you're doing now right after you you left but what was that conversation like internally i'm sure you you still probably were like fighting both sides of like do i want to stay longer or do i want to you know do something else yeah because i left pretty early i was you know i had opportunities to keep playing and you know oftentimes like a maybe a reduced role um but some situations it was to you know continue on as a, as a starter and I was just, all my opportunities were Midwest or back East and, and my kids were, you know, kind of getting sad every time I left, they were old enough to, to realize I was leaving a lot and it's just hard. And, and I, I just sort of lost some of that, the drive and it's hard to, to play that kind of season without it. So, you know, I decided, you know, after, after the 2007 season with the Mets, um, to retire and even before that season was in, I, I just was trying to think about what I want to do next. You know, I wanted to, uh, I had all these crazy ideas. Um, one was with an artist and, you know, to, to help build her brand and do different things. So I was like, I had different, um, different ideas, but yeah, you know, I knew that I didn't want to just sit at home or golf or do, you know, things like that. I, I do like to do those things, but you know, I wanted to have a passion because I think it's important, especially when you're, you know, 35 years old to have something that gets you excited to get out of bed every day. And, um, so I bounced around a few different things uh, for a couple of years. I did, I wrote a book as well called The Way of Baseball. Um, and so that, that took some time. And, you know, I, I learned, you know, in some kind of entrepreneurial things after my career, kind of what to do, what not to do. And, and then I, I gravitated towards starting um, Greenfly about, um, I guess it was probably about 2012, 2013, whatever, whatever that was. And I just had this idea because I was still getting hit up by media companies to, um, to, to, you know, send video in or, or send a, a sound bite to talk about something that's related someone's doing today that's related to my career. And, um, so my idea was to build an app that, that facilitated that where, you know, you get a network of people that are experts, you know, in sports and have a, have them have an app and have a back end where, you know, ESPN or whoever the, the broadcaster is can say, Hey, you know, Kobe just blew his Achilles heel out and type in Achilles and get team doctors or players that have had that injury and then get videos back. And that was the original concept. And that's what the first prototype of Greenfly that was built, you know, way back when was, and obviously it's evolved, uh, you know, quite a bit from there. 
How much of the entrepreneurial success today do you attribute to the challenges you faced on the diamond and what that looked like as you as you grew? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think, yeah, it's baseball is a, more than any other sport that I know, uh, especially as a hitter. It's like you get knocked down all the time, like fail both seven literally times out of 10 and be a superstar fail seven times out of 10. And yeah, and it, I think we're pretty hard headed. It's like, OK, you know, I, I'm trying to hit a guy throwing 97 miles an hour, throwing other stuff. And, I, you know, thinking that you can do that consistently is kind of you're kind of crazy. Right. And I think you got to have the mentality to. Um, to be successful starting a business and, and, uh, you know, people tell you all the time that certain things aren't going to work and, um, you kind of have to be hard headed and, and if you believe in it and you see the vision and, and you start to see success in, in, a, in the market, then you dive in all the way. And when you're talking about hitting someone throws 96, 97, it's pretty well known that hitting a baseball is one of the hardest things to do in any sport, right? Comparing that to probably the first couple of years of entrepreneurship, did you feel like one was harder than the other? You're like, man, I wish I could go back and hit baseballs. It's easier than trying to fundraise or something like that. Yes, yes and no. I, th I think in terms of the challenges, like baseball is very, it's very, you know, in your face acute. It's like right now, if I'm not feeling good, I'm in, I'm in trouble because there's nowhere I could hide. It's like you're super exposed. I think as an entrepreneur, you have... Um, there's, you have different paths to go through. So if something doesn't work, it's, it's like you kind of slowly like, you know, meander in a different direction and, and figure out what does work. So you're going to, you know, getting, going 0 for 20 is maybe more painful than, and then knowing the next day you're facing Randy Johnson, like that's probably more painful than, you know, getting, you know, 10 or 20 no's yeah. um, when you're fundraising. Because, you know, there's there's a lot of funds to go out there. You keep going, and all of a sudden you get that meeting or two or three, and all of a sudden you have some options. And, and uh, yeah, and, and when you're hitting, it's when, when things are bad, there's kind of nowhere to hide. Yeah. What was it like facing a few of these guys? Like, when you look back, like, who was that guy where you're like, man, I just, that was, I was I'm not ready for this. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think a lot of lefties in my era is, is Mariano Rivera. Yeah. You probably thought I was going to say Randy Johnson, but it was actually, I, I I'd rather face him over Rivera. I mean, he's now, I think he went in the Hall of Fame this past year. Yeah. Um, but he was, he was the toughest guy. And he had one pitch that he basically threw over and over again. It's a 95 to 97 mile an hour cutter in, in on your hands as a lefty. And it, it was almost like an optical illusion. Like it looked like it was going to be in one place. And then when you swung it, you know, basically was breaking your bat. So I'd always bring my worst bat because you have, you know, you have like three or four bats yeah. in the, you know, in the dugout. And uh, I grabbed the worst one I had. Because I don't want to break it. It's just like 2001 World Series, right? Luis yeah. Gonzalez. No, exactly. I was I was there in Arizona for that. And yeah. It was it was crazy times. But um, now, as you look post athletic career and, and into what you're doing with Greenfly and, and where you want to go from an entrepreneur standpoint, uh, as you take a step back, like you probably did when that you had that month reset, what was that month reset like coming into? entrepreneurship out of baseball, right? Where you have a very regimented, I'm here at the park by now, this is what I'm doing. It's a, now it's just an open ocean for the most part. Yeah, no, it's, I don't know if there's necessarily a month reset, but uh, there's, there's a lot of moments where, you know, things are going, things are going great, but then you have a moment where it's like, okay, like this didn't work out. And then you kind of take a step back and figure out what you need to do differently. And, you know, as you know, those things, I think in a startup happen, you know, every so many months, whether it's a small thing or whether it's a bigger thing and, and that's where you get better. And it's like, okay, maybe we need to add this functionality because, um, you know, these customers want it, or we lost a customer that wanted different functionality and there's a reason and you build that the next time and you build it better. And, and then when you, when things come back around, that customer comes back to you or you just get a bunch of new customers who, because you learn from the, the the first customer, and I think that's, um, you know, that's the best thing I th I think about building. So we build a really good product and put it out there, and then your customers give you the answers, which is great, and and we listen to them, and and that's like a big part of our our culture is you know we have a, a really strong dev team, we're a software company, we build great software, and it gets easier and easier as you go along because you get great customers who are, you know, industry leaders, you know, globally, 
and and small small businesses as well and and they tell you what they need and and uh you know they they tend to need the same things pretty much as you look back now too and and with the time right you get drafted out of high school going to the blue jays i'm sure you probably never even thought about being a tech founder tech ceo is this journey continues what what do you think is next right would, would you either be remembered as Sean Green, the athlete, Sean Green, the entrepreneur, both. What What is that next step, next level for you as, as you build? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't really think about how to be remembered or anything, but I, you know, I definitely want um, this chapter of my life to be um, the most meaningful in, in, in a lot of ways. I, I want it, um, I think it has you know, I think this company has the potential to do amazing things. And, um, you know, I felt the same way as a kid planning on playing in the major leagues. I had the same like drive that, and, and confidence that it's going to happen. And so I, I feel the same way that I felt then about this. And, um, you know, this is right now, this is what I, I love spending my time focusing on and trying to solve different problems. And as I said, you know, it's, it all comes down to having a great team, which we do. Um, and you know, right now, like Daniel's our CEO and, and he's my co-founder and, you know, I, I trust his instincts and I trust, and, and we both trust our team's instincts to make the right decisions on, you know, what to build next and, and what markets to, to approach and, and all those things. And, and just like sports, it, it comes down, you could have a great idea, but it all comes down to team and execution. And do you think it's been more execution and team than something like luck? You gotta have luck too. I mean, it's, yeah, it's the same in, in, in anything you gotta have. There's, you know, we look back sometimes on some key moments that could have gone one way or the other, and we've had a lot of great luck and we've had some bad luck. And it's a matter of, you know, just, I think, I think for a lot of startups, you want to just, you want to stay in the game and, um, and have the right people to, to kind of build and, and do the right things. And the longer you stay in the game, I think the luck will, you know, kind of even out. Um, obviously that's, we used to say as a hitter, you know, at the end of the season, you know, the ones you get robbed or the luck, the lucky hits you get kind of even out and maybe they do, maybe they don't, but you know, it's kind of what I like to think is, generally the case where you know you just kind of bear down and you get a bad break you get a bad break and you keep moving on and for you keep moving on what was that like too i'm sure you probably had some low lows when you started greenfly and you went through that process what was it like working your way out of it just like you worked your way out of the slump or the hitting change yeah i mean we we had different moments for sure but um yeah, I, I think it's it's really the it's the same mentality. It's like you you believe if you believe strong enough in in your business and what you do, then um, you know everything's gonna everything's gonna level off. And um, you know it's it's kind of funny. As a hitter, I was pretty streaky, and you know I, when I get really hot, it would it would last for a while, and we get cold. It you know hopefully it wouldn't last too long, but yeah. sometimes it did. And it seems like that's the case in business is you get these hot streaks where all of a sudden you get all this incoming and then, you know, something might happen where, you know, you have to part ways with an employee or something. Like, and it seems like, yeah, you know, those tend to be in, in bunches. Um, but you know, I, again, it's like, it's a matter of just holding, holding course and, um, and continuing to, to focus on the right things. And, and at that point, you know, you know, you're going to, you're going to, you know, if the bad times are going to come back up and the good times aren't going to, you know, go, you know, at the crazy speed forever. So you got to be sort of even keeled. Now that you've done this for five years, going on six, how is the perception too from an inbound, from an athlete standpoint too? Like, I'm sure you've had a lot of people reach out to you and say, Hey, like, this is what I want to do, especially as we've seen more of these athletes, like we spoke about talking about their investments in the locker room and out their cars, right? Has, have you seen a lot of, of inbound there and kind of what has it been like mentoring some of these other people as you've gone through this, the challenge over the last five years? Yeah. And no, I love to see when former athletes want to get into, I love to see when they want to get into something that's, um, not just 
kind of a vanity project. You know, a lot of, a lot of guys will do and which is fine too, but a lot of guys will want to, you know, do something that, um, just sort of builds off of their fame and, and it's not really innovative, but I'd love to see, you know, like Ryan Howard is a, a VC now and he's like completely, you know, he's, he dove in, you know, feet first and in, into, you know, he's at 76 capital. And, you know, I think that's awesome. I know other guys who went and got really into the real estate and, and, uh, have done well there. So it's to see guys do things that are not just like, you know, kind of just drafting off of their careers. Um, you do get a boost no matter what you do, cause you get more doors that open. Um, a lot of people, you know, obviously are fans and, and will give you more time a day than, than just the average entrepreneur. But I, I think it's, it's really cool to, it's really cool to learn something new. That's, um, you know, a whole new trade and a whole new set of, of tools that you obviously pull from your previous career, but it's, it's all new. What was that big thing that you've learned or what has been that big thing that you've learned throughout this, the second career and this new process? I mean, I think learning, you know, how to build a technology platform and a business all at the same time. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a, you know, business school, you know, in action, in action. Yeah. And, um, I'm not saying like, there's no way I'm, I'm not an expert in anything, but, um, you know, I, I've learned a lot and, and it's a, it's a skill that I think as a player, you, you can't just expect because you've been successful on the field that that'll translate, um, into, to building a business. And I think it's challenging for players because when you're, when you have a, a successful career, you you rely on your agents to handle the contract negotiations, you rely on your financial advisors to handle that stuff. You rely maybe a, nowadays more, of, you know, social media and publicists will do more stuff for players. So everyone's doing, you're, you kind of become a quarterback, handle everyone else is doing things. Um, but when you're in business, you, there's a little bit more hands-on that you have to do, um, especially if you're gonna be successful. And, and uh, you know, that's something, you know, whether it's going to, you know, pitch meetings or, um, presenting or doing different things, like it's, you got to do it. And, um, I think, I think that was a challenging transition at first because I was used to having, um, everyone, you know, kind of do things. I was, I was more, you know, make sure you get this done. And I, you know, I still, we have, you know, a, a good team and people are doing different things. Um, and I'm definitely more involved in, in the management side, but, um, there is a lot more hands-on than I think you have, um, maybe you expect as a player transitioning. Because at the time, your business was what you were doing on the field. Your business was showing up and hitting, right? Yeah, and it was very, it was very defined, right? Whereas as a founder, um, it's less defined. I mean, it's like, especially early on, it's like, okay, what are we gonna do today? You know, we're trying to build this business. What what should we do? And um, where do we start? And there's a lot more of that. But um, yeah, I, I think as you move, as you progress into, you know, your, excuse me, years in the market and all that stuff, um, the, the days become a little, a little better defined like they do as a, as a player, because you have, there's always some burning item that needs to be addressed. Did you have a moment as you've gone through this process where you're like, we know this is, this is going to work. We know this, this is, this is something. Yeah. I mean, there's been, there's been a lot of ones. So we, we had good adoption early on. Um, as I said early on our platform, which, I mean, I don't know, I haven't even said what we do, but it's, it's really a, a it's a software solution for brands, which includes sports teams and, um, media companies and, and, you know, just traditional brands to collaborate with their most important advocates and influencers and staff members to create and share content on social. And, and it's kind of like a Slack type platform to go back to Slack, um, where, you know, you can get content from those people to share on the, on the um, brand channels, or you can send content out, just one, one off content to have them share onto their channels with copy. And the big innovation lately that's re really been transformative is a whole connection, you know, automated flow of, of, you know, galleries of content to the right people at the right times. So, you know, for example, Major League Baseball, when the players, um, their, their, all their content, there's, you know, over a million pieces of content that have flown through our system, uh, flowed through our system this year, and when they get off the field, they have their photos, you know, highlights from the game and video clips and things like that. 
Um, and when they share it, our system tracks everything. So that's how, that's more of a sports use case. Whereas brand use cases are, you know, often, you know, send an unboxing video of this, you know, clothing item. And those videos come back to headquarters. Another example is like franchises um, to just collaborate with, you know, the, the corporate can collaborate with the different franchisees around their, um, you know, around their social content with copy and galleries of content, all these types of things. So it's, it's kind of like that Slack workflow. But I think the the one that's resonated the most <clears throat> recently has been this whole like gallery connection um, where, you know, the, the athletes, since we're talking sports, the athletes just love it. They keep coming on. They're asking to be put on the platform. They want to um, get all their content and and share it. And, and that's, that's been something where we've seen the appetite and um, we just really leaned into that. Do you think your career would have played out differently if you had the social media tools that they have now? You know, it's funny because I think back then it was sort of frowned upon to, to be active um, publicly more. I, I think social media was just starting. So I retired in 07, Facebook started in 03, 04, yeah. right? Um, Twitter was just starting. But the attitude then, like teammates and within the league is that, oh, this guy's not focused on what he should be focused on. And that's changed a lot. So, you know, it's hard coming from my era to to understand, at, you know, for those people to understand how important the social side is. Now, being in the business, I would tell guys like, you're crazy to not build your social footprint, not only for what you're doing now in your career, um, but post-career, it's, it's just such a big opportunity. Um, and you got to take advantage of it while you have the audience that, that you have. So, um, and I think the younger generation understands that much more, you know, guys coming up, um, you know, I have two teenage daughters and they're always on Instagram and Snapchat. I mean, they, they understand it. So, uh, you know, I think that's just, just kind of how they grow up now and which is good. I mean, I, I think, um, I think it's good for sports and it's good for, you know, uh, the marketing of, of the sport as a whole and, and the individual players to, to build those, those individuals up and, you know, create a bigger following for them because in turn, the more people are going to tune in and watch the sports. When you were a kid, you said Ricky Henderson was your baseball idol, your baseball mentor. Now as an adult, who's the, the business idol, the business mentor? That's a good question. I don't know. There's, there's a lot. I mean, I, uh, I, one guy that I got to know who is involved with Greenfy is uh, Peter Goober. Um, he's, I think he's, We've met with him, you know, a bunch of times over the years. And from the first meeting, you know, he's a super successful guy, you know, one of the owners of the Dodgers, one of the owners of the Golden State Warriors, you know, basically produced all the best movies in the 1980s. And before that was a, a you know, a music mogul. So, I mean, he's just a super successful guy, but you meet with him and he's like telling you, you know, I'm gonna connect you with this person, this person, this person. And like you leave, by the time you're in the car, you have like four emails connecting you to different people. And he's just, He's so gracious with his, um, you know, his willingness to help. And, and that's the kind of person that I think I aspire to be as an entrepreneur is like when, when the right, um, people are coming and, and wanting help to be able to just not say your new stuff, but just to, to really like dive in and, and give your suggestions, give your feedback and, and, and help out when you can. So I'm assuming you retired when you felt like you had probably done it all that you could in baseball. When you retire in business, which maybe never, like, what is it that you want to say, like, I did it all, right? Maybe you don't know, but like, what is that moment where you're like, maybe it's sell Greenfly and start another business, or what is that I did it moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have one of those. Like, I, I just want to, like, from a Greenfly standpoint, I, you know, it'd be obviously the goal is always to, you know, sell something, make a lot of money or exit in some way, but I'm having so much fun doing it. Like I, I wouldn't want to do that, you know, anytime soon, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I want to build something great and, and do something that is going to, um, have a positive impact on, um, the markets that we're serving. Right. And in the case, you know, so far what we're doing is it's been, you know, players are thanking us all the time, you know, sending, you know, emails or whatever, you know, we hear through the grapevine or whatever, they, they love it. And, you know, there's an article in Yahoo Sports talking about, you know, 
Alonzo on the Mets and how his mom loves the opportunity now to get all this content. And I would have loved to have had that stuff for my mom, you know, cause she was always bugging me for photos and things like that. But yeah. just to have access to all this stuff. And then, you know, others are thank, you know, thankful that their accounts are being grown. I, there's, there's one athlete um, who's a, a runner that had, I think her, her Instagram following like went up by like 50% after, you know, a couple posts that she did that were such good content because the brand supported that post and, and helped helped her. And, and so those types of things are, I think are really, are really gratifying. And so there's not like a, it's not like a big, you know, you know, I want to sell it for X number of dollars and that'll be the moment it's, you know, I, I think there's, you know, at some point going to be something real positive that happens on that end. And that's great. But, you know, I, I'm enjoying doing it and it's almost scary. Like once we do exit, like what, what am I going to do that I'm going to enjoy as much as this? If you had to do it all over again from the very beginning, would there be anything along the way that you changed, adjusted? In terms tough. of the company or just career? career company, everything? Yeah. I mean, you can go back and look at a lot of things, right? I mean, there's, there's moments like sometimes, um, you know, I, I just, I don't know if I would change things in, from a playing standpoint, I, there's things I wonder what would have happened if I, had I not, you know, got traded or have I blocked this trade? What, you know, what would have happened? So you think about things like that. Um, but it's not, there's nothing, I can't say I would go back. Like if you gave me a time machine and said, you want to go back and play your career over, I'd be kind of scared to do that. I think, um, yeah, I think it worked out well. Um, in terms of the company, I mean, it's sort of the same thing. I mean, there's, you know, maybe should we have, you know, built this feature a year earlier than we did, or, you know, you, you can go back and drive yourself crazy and think of all these different scenarios. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, the company's doing well and our customers are really happy and we're growing really quickly. And, um, you know, so we're trying to make the right, de right decisions now going forward. Um, like we, we feel like we did for the most part, you know, the first five years that we've been around. And now has there been a piece of advice, player, business, whatever that stuck with you throughout that you kind of look at as your, your North star? I wouldn't say there's, there's not a North star. There's probably a lot of little stars scattered around, but, um, no, I, I think again, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, I think just kind of staying that even keel and staying in the moment and just trying to, just trying to execute and, you know, staying in the game, you know, stay in the game and, you know, you add more customers, you're going to get more feedback. They're going to give you, um, better ideas of, you know, kind of, you know, there's a lot of paths you can take a product in a, in a, in a business model and, and just, just, just kind of be patient and just watch, just watch and, and listen. And that's, I think those are the most important things as an entrepreneur, just like hitting, like I, when I became a better hitter is when I learned how to watch the pitcher and just say, okay, what's he really trying to do and understand that. And it's not just going up there and seeing the ball and hitting it. Right. It's the same thing in, in business. Like I want to watch and see, you know, what are these, what, how are they using our platform or, you know, what can we do differently and, and, and just kind of listen. And, and I think that's the, um, the best thing you can do as a, as a, an entrepreneur or as an athlete.